Okay. Uh, now, we, when we ended last week, we were looking at the activities, but uh, when, we, when we ended last week, I was talking about uh, the activities of Satan and demons, and I mentioned that Satan is opposed to all that God wills. I mean, he's, he's the adversary, so that makes sense. He's opposed to all that God wills, meanings, which, which means, among other things, that he's opposed to people living righteously. He's opposed to people accepting the gospel, and he's opposed to people remaining faithful to Christ. So all of this he's working against, uh, among other things. Now, I also mentioned that demons can take possession of people. That's obvious in the Bible they're doing that. And I quoted uh, Dwayne Garrett's remark about why the frequency of possessions in Jesus' ministry and in the first century seems so much greater than in the rest of the Bible and in modern Western society. And he had three ideas that I think are reasonable. I think there's some truth in all of those. But I want to pick back up there and then just quickly wrap this up. Talking about, you know, when I say, well, the demons in Scripture, they do possess people. Whatever the overall level of demon activity, I don't believe that a Christian who is faithfully abiding in Christ can be demon-possessed in the sense of being indwelt by a demon. Okay, I don't think that that can happen. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that the Christian is controlled by the indwelling Spirit of God, and our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, and there's no agreement between the temple of God and idols, he says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. So I don't think that a, a Christian who's living faithfully can be possessed by a demon. There are no examples in Scripture of a faithful Christian being indwelt by a demon. But Christians can be influenced by demons. That's the whole talk about temptation and all that kind of thing. What we're talking about is, is a degree. Uh, the nature and degree of demonic influence, I don't think Christians can be possessed. They can be tempted. They can be influenced. But there's a difference in whether they can be possessed, and I don't think they can be. Now, demons have apparently worked miracles in the past. I say that for a number of reasons. Pharaoh's magicians whose names, Janus and Jambres, they were preserved in Jewish literature, and those names are acknowledged by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. They worked miracles opposing Moses. Now, something's going on behind what they were doing. And so I, I see that. I see Satan in the book of Job. He's, he's allowed to call down fire from heaven. He's allowed to have, you know, apparently direct the windstorm. So I think demons have worked miracles in the past. Now I'm going to give you my, my take on that, is that the wonder-working powers of demons have been seriously curtailed, and they will not be restored until the end of this overlap of ages. This is how I understand. I'm not going to go into all this when I do the talk on eschatology. But this is how I understand the chaining of Satan in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. I understand it. What I, what I think is being communicated is that his miracle-working powers are seriously curtailed or restricted. He is prevented from doing nation-gathering miracles. And I think that, you see, because, because the purpose of the chaining, it's said to prevent him from deceiving the nations... And the means by which you'll ultimately deceive the nations into gathering against God is the exercise of miraculous power. At least that's how it looks to me. You see this in, in the end, demons will perform fantastic miracles that will deceive people. You see, so he said, change them to keep them from deceiving the nations. How are they going to deceive the nations? You see this miraculous power. So it looks to me like at some point in the future that chain will be released. They will be allowed to do these things. That will factor into uh, the gathering of, of people against God. Okay, that's all kind of beside the point, but I wanted to tell you, it seems that they've worked miracles. I don't know what level of, of powers demons have currently. If I'm right about the chaining being a restriction on their miracle-working power, it's not clear how far that is curtailed. Certainly it seems to me that it, they're restricted from doing what I would call nation-gathering miracles, showstoppers. The kinds of miracles that he indicates are going to be fundamental in gathering people and deceiving them at the end. You see in Matthew 24, 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10, Revelation 13, 13 and 14, Revelation 16, verse 14, Revelation 19, verse 20. 
All of those say to me that miracle working powers of demonic elements are going to be important in the end. Okay. Uh, so, I wanted you to see that they worked miracles in the past. Now, a word about spiritual warfare. To me, this is a comforting thing. The Christian response is to, to Satan is to resist him. Standing firm in the faith. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. And James chapter 4, verse 7 says, If you do this, he will flee from you. You see, that to me is a tremendous... Uh, you know, this idea, all the movies and everything of Christians, the idea that Satan overpowers you, that you are seeking to resist him. It doesn't seem that he's given that. You see, he, he's not given that power to do that. He says, you are to resist him. Peter says, standing firm in the faith. James says, resist him and what? He will flee from you. He's deprived of that power to come and just say, no, I'm going to overpower you. You see, so I, that, I think that, that's a comforting thing. Now, the most explicit passage of how to resist, I think, is in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. I don't know how long you've been coming to the class, but not too long ago I taught Ephesians and I went through that. I'm not going to take the time to go through it again, but it's, you know, put on the full armor of God. And there are a number of things there we can learn about how do we resist that are interesting. Of course, it goes without saying that we should absolutely avoid all occultic practices. You know, not to, not to, we should not be involved in opening ourselves up to the demonic. You know, we can't be, can't be doing that kind of thing, contacting spirits or dead people or, expo- or, or exploring things like mystical experiences, soul travel, you know, Ekankar and all that kind of stuff, fortune telling. And we should, we should avoid the objects that are connected with those kinds of things like tarot cards, crystal balls, Ouija boards, uh, demonic symbols. You know, what do we have doing with any of that? You see, when you start to play in that realm and open yourself up, don't do it. So, I mean, that to me is just a, you know, a no-brainer is that you don't mess with that kind of stuff. Because these powers are real. And we need to be careful about that. All right, the devil stands under the fate of Satan and demons. The devil stands under condemnation. You see that in First Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. And in the end, God will cast him and his angels into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 10, and Matthew 25, verse 41. We could say a lot more about the subject, uh, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to move on. I want to say some, something. Uh, this class, next class, hopefully I can finish the part on eschatology there, and then the next class on the intermediate state of the dead. If not, then I'm going to creep into the next Sunday.